Good evening, everybody. Quarter after eight on Monday. Time to get your week set straight. And uh, we're getting rolling tonight. So hopefully we're going to wait a little bit till we get a bunch of people to jump on here with us. And uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to talk about common mistakes tonight. Uh, common mistakes that we do with our dogs. Got to mute my computer here for a second. Common mistakes that we make with our dogs. I think it's important that uh, we go over some of these things because I think as much as we teach people what they should do, uh, we don't ever really address what people shouldn't do or um, you know, maybe help clean things up, help make some tweaks here and there, something along those, uh, those lines. So that's kind of where I'm at tonight. And on top of that, obviously, if you guys have any questions or anything, then, then please feel free to let me know, obviously, because uh, this is what I'm here for. You guys, every Monday night, we do this, and we usually have a pretty good turnout, and we usually go for a little while, too, which is pretty cool. So I've got my little list made here of some common mistakes. Here's my first one, and I hope you guys are ready. Letting your dogs getting up on the furniture. I think this is a mistake. And the reason is, is because I think it's important for us to control your dog's space. Now, if you have happy-go-lucky Lassie or Fido and you have no issues whatsoever with your dog, I don't see this as being a big deal, okay? Now, if you have a dog that doesn't, isn't able to make those good decisions that you want your dog to make, whether it be how they socialize, how they greet guests, how they deal with you, I think that's important that Things like the stuff, the things that we're going to talk about tonight are things that you guys should um, address one way or the other. Now, furniture. Again, I think it's a biggie because your dog is deciding that it can get up on something. And dogs don't naturally do that. This is obviously something that's very comfortable to them. A lot of times we'll hear people say um, that their dog has its own futon or the dog has its own uh, roll uh, sofa. Uh, or love seat, uh, has its own chair, anything along those lines. And it gets to be a little bit much when the dog actually has its own furniture in the house. Uh, or even sometimes the dog has its own room in the house with all sorts of furniture that they can get up on. So furniture to me is a biggie, you guys. Again, and this goes to the people that if you are having some issues with your dogs, this is one thing that we should take away from them. It's not up to them to be able to get up onto the furniture when you say, uh, without you saying so. Now, if you want to invite them up on, uh, Dave, how, how do you stop them after you've been letting them? Um, first things first, we can't control them when we're gone from the house. So whether you need to put up some sort of block or tip the cushions up or whatever you got to do while you're gone, that's fine. However, you guys, we all know when our dogs start walking over towards that certain spot that they prefer, okay, when they get three, four, five, six, seven feet away, make a correction sound. Give them a quick hey, snap your fingers, a quick clap, something that gets their attention. And when they look at you, you say no, all right? Now, if they continue to go towards the couch or towards that spot, you have to address it again. You, this is not something that can't be left um, not dealt with, okay? Something has to be done to correct it so they understand where you're coming from. You guys are the ones that pays the bills to the house, not your dog. Should be your rules, not your dog's rules. Now, if you stop them, great. Let them be, let them think about it, let them focus on what they should or shouldn't do. It's up to them to make a decision. The cool part is, is that they've gone down that same path every time, you put up the dead end sign and they've got to go left or right. That's all there is to it. And I think that's important for your dog to actually sit there and process things and understand that uh, it's going to require some thinking, different thinking. And you guys, it's not a bad thing for your dog to think. Let their instincts come into play here. Let them think about what they should or shouldn't do. And if they start pacing around, Okay, I'm gonna let them pace for a little while, a little while, because they're trying to figure out what they need to do. Sometimes you need to give them a little direction. Sometimes you don't. But either way, I'm gonna let them just kind of simmer on it for a little while and, and see what they do. So again, you guys, to to me, number one is furniture. All right. Now, something that's gonna go along with that too. Uh, and thank you for all the holy cow. 
all the hearts and sounds or the smiles and all that kind of stuff. Very cool, whoever's doing that. So thank you. Um, the bed is the other one, you guys, and this was kind of one I was going to put down on the list, but um, to me, again, if you have the dog that's not that big of a, you know, that's making good decisions, then so be it. It's fine. However, I can't tell you how many couples that I run into where the dog is actually in bed with them, and not only does the is the dog in bed, but the dog is in bed between husband and wife. And I think there's something wrong with that, personally. And, and this is more from a just a father or husband than it is a dog trainer, um, more than anything. So I, that, I think that's something that should be addressed. I think your bed is made for you and your significant other. Um, and again, if your dog is, is making all the decisions you want them to make and is a good dog, then so be it. It drives me insane having a dog in bed, and I, I just I I, I prefer the, to have the extra room. Uh, Dave, how do you suggest we make a correction? I think you make a correction sound, Dave. Whether it's a hey, uh uh, no, um, snap of the fingers, clap of the hands, but there has to be an intention that goes along with it too. We can't just make the sound and just think that our dog's going to understand that we're saying no to getting up on the couch. I don't think it works that way. What I do think will work is if you make a snap of the fingers and you get up and you take a couple steps towards your dog, I think your dog will understand that you mean business and that it's not something that should be taken lightly. And if the dog moves away, all we're looking for is acknowledgement of what you did to me, okay? Once you get that acknowledgement, then I think you're on the right track. You can sit back down. If your dog paces around, comes back that, to that same spot for the couch or the chair, I think we make that same correction sound, that same intention from you uh, to communicate to them that you actually mean business and that if they get near that spot on the couch or the chair, that uh, they're not allowed to do that anymore. So again, it may take some time, you guys. Don't think that it's going to take one correction sound and then you're good to go from there. I, I think it's going to take some time, especially the older dogs. You know the old adage, you can't, you, keep an, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can. It just may take a little bit longer because they're stuck in their way and they've been in uh, that routine for quite some time, okay? Now, to get back to that bed thing, I, I think it's really important, you guys, um, and this is this is my point of view. I don't, sleeping in the bed, again, if you have the happy-go-lucky dog, have at it. Enjoy yourself. Uh, my cat's got to come in. Hopefully he can come in without letting all the bugs in. Yeah, buddy. <clears throat> um, but I think there's I think there's an issue, you guys. I think there is an under. I'm gonna. You guys, you're gonna hear it first. Here, okay. I think there is an underlying issue going on if your dog is sleeping between you and your significant other in bed. I think there is an issue there uh, going on. Personal opinion. Again, talking more from person than dog trainer at this point. But I think there is an underlying issue going on that if you allow your dog to get in between you and your significant other sleeping, I think that that can pose a very, very large problem in the overall scheme of your relationship, which can also affect the way that your dog sees the whole dynamic of you guys as well in the family. So that's something for you and your significant other to figure out. Now, what do you do to prevent the dog to get up on the bed? You know, like we obviously, you know, we're sleeping in the middle of the night. We can't exactly stay up and wait for your dog to make that jump to get up on. Now, one thing that you can do is tether your dog to the foot of the bed on a leash that's too short for them to get up on the bed. Okay? Tether them to the foot of the bed. Give them a bed on the floor to, to, uh, to sleep on or their cushion or whatever you have for them. I think that's really important that you give them something to have so at least they don't... You know, they're not pacing around the house, you know, anything along those lines. So I think it's really important um, to give them something to be on. So at least when they do settle in, they're comfortable and then they can be there. But again, this is going to take some time, you guys. you got to understand that anytime you introduce something new to them, that it, there's going to be a change, okay? You're going to change the way they're thinking. You're going to change their routine, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's all a part of what we have to do with our dogs sometimes for them to make them realize that we mean business. Sometimes we got to take their world, flip it upside down, okay? So, again, furniture and bed, kind of one and the same, but, again, 
uh, going back to the bed thing, I think there's there's some other stuff that's uh, that's going on. Now, uh, the, it's a lot easier when you have a uh, Jack Russell than if you do a very large German Shepherd. But remember, it doesn't matter the size of the dog, it still means the same to the dog, okay? It means the same to the dog, and it also means the same to your significant other as well, all right? Again, you guys, I'm weathering any questions that you have tonight as well. So if it's anything socializing or behavior, um, I'm more than happy to, uh, or training, to answer those questions, and we'll go mid-stride. But I think tonight, just kind of this common theme, I think, is something that we haven't really truly addressed before, which is the common mistakes of, of really some of the things that we do with dogs. So again, we've talked about getting up on furniture and also um, getting into bed with us at night. Now, here's your third one. <clears throat> toys okay you guys toys 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 pick them up put them in a box put that box in a closet put that box somewhere where your dog's not allowed to go pick one out and bring it to you and say mommy or daddy it's time to play I know it sounds harsh right it, it's so bad I, I, I'm a very mean trainer However, it's more important to you and your dog and your relationship if you actually control that time when, where, and for how long that the dog actually gets to play with that toy. I can't tell you how many consultations I went on early, early on in my career where there were just toys all over the place and there's no concept of why their dog isn't a good dog. We give him everything. We give him everything that he needs, stuff to chew on, stuff to tug with. Uh, we play with him all the time, uh, and we just don't understand. We're giving him everything that we, thinks, we think that he wants, except structure, you guys, all right? So all those toys, yes, you can keep them. Oh, we're gonna do a little subcategory here for a second, or when I get there. I just thought of, hold on, I gotta write it down so I don't forget. Okay. So, that box of toys goes in the closet. Now, once a day, maybe twice, if you need to go in there and grab the, the rope toy, the frisbee, the tennis ball. By the way, you guys, I don't know if you know this, tennis balls aren't really actually that good for dogs, okay? Uh, they're very abrasive, um, and also that tennis ball inside their mouth can actually start, um, it's almost like sandpaper on their teeth and uh, vets will actually tell you that they can actually see where the tennis ball, if they can look inside the dog's mouth, they can actually tell where it would fit in the dog's mouth because it's worn down their teeth so much. So um, not sure if you're aware of that or not, or not, but it's just something to consider. So if your dog is obsessed about tennis balls and always has one, always has one, uh, there's a good chance that they have that shape uh, amongst their teeth in their mouth already. So now, you guys, if you're going to go play with your dog, go play with your dog. But you guys start the session of playing and you guys finish the session of playing. I think it's very, very important for you guys to establish that, okay? This isn't the uh, time where, um, you know, little Benny is going to go over and pick his little toy out, his favorite one, and bring it over to you and say, um, you know, mommy and daddy, let's let's play and then plays with you for four or five minutes and then the dog's done. And here you are left with a toy. So guess who started it and guess who finished it, okay? You guys, every little, every little interaction that you have with your dog means something, okay? Uh, Mika, do you think we should take the toy away if the dog is ripping the toy up? And is Tug really not a good game to play? Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan if the dog is ripping the toy up. I think I'm going to give something to the dog that they can actually chew on and really get their teeth into. Uh, so if you want to go the Kong route, if you want to go a bully stick route, if you want to go raw, marrow bone, raw, okay, raw, not cooked, raw, marrow bone, then go down that road. Just make sure it's, it's the big bone kind and not like the little uh, medallions. Don't get the little medallions because they can go down and get caught and that kind of stuff. Uh, and is Tug really a good game? Not a good game to play. So look, Mika, I here's the thing. I, I've seen Tug played with trainers, and, and trainers have very, very good control over that. There's some trainers that want to have that ability to control the intensity and be able to shut it off at that intensity. So I get it. 
uh, in that aspect. However, I also don't want to, and this is me personally, I, I, don't, I don't think I really want to mess around with a dog and, and practice that intensity. I don't want our relationship to be that intensity, but that's just me. So I, I, again, I think, I think there's a lot to be said about the whole tug game. I don't think it's the end of the world by any means if you play, as long as you structure it correctly, and as long as you guys have fun doing it. That's really the most important thing. Um, and I guess Melo. I have a hairless Chinese crested. He has been groomed since he was a puppy, and now he will not let me take him out of the car at the groomers. He just growls and will not let me get him out. Any suggestions? Uh, is I I would Melo. My I guess my question would be is if if he's on leash, are you trying to grab him and he's growling at you that way? Uh, the other part of it too, I think Chinese crested are quite small, so he should be in a crate. Um, and that will end that because when you get to the groomers and you just grab the crate and go in, I think that's going to be your best bet. Uh, otherwise, your dog's going to start the growling and learning that actually that's what creates what the dog wants. And then that can start to be used in other aspects of the dog's life. So I'm not going to practice or give that dog a chance to um, get to that state of mind every time and to be able to win and create space through the growling and the snapping and teeth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's kind of where I'm going with that one. Uh, Brady, Brady, Brady's back. Uh, here's my question tonight. My dog has severe anxiety about riding in the car and it's not easy to just pick him up and put him in the car. He weighs over 100 pounds. Rescue dog and I don't know a lot of history. I can manage to get him in when we go to the vet, but he literally shakes the whole time, won't look out the window, just keeps his head right next to me and trembles. Really want to get him in the car so we can go places and work on the socialization so he desperately needs. I've tried doing very short trips so he knows he's coming back home, but that hasn't seemed to help. I would actually, Brady, I would actually go even shorter. Maybe there's something he doesn't like about the group. Brady, I would go even shorter. Instead of going the short trips, Practice getting him in the car and out, and in the car and out, and in the car and out, in the driveway, um, the best that you can. I, you have to start sh uh, smaller. I think you're going too far too fast uh, for your dog to get used to it. So I think it's going, and here's the thing. When you do this, it's really important. You got you to gotta listen to this, okay? So if you have to write this down, or if you have to rewind it and watch it later, and, and put this down, then do it, okay? Uh, let's say, I gotta do with my hand thing again. Okay, so let's say this is the step into the car, all right? And you're walking your dog. As soon as your dog gets one paw up on the, the car, okay? At that point, your dog is on leash. At that point, take your dog and walk away from the car. Because all you're telling him is, look, just put your paw up on here and we'll move away from the car, okay? So think of this in terms of pressure and release. Pressure and release, all right? And then eventually want to get to the point where once we can do this comfortably, sometimes the first two feet will get up going, or, or the front legs will get up in the car and then walk away, okay? Because we want to teach the dog to do it on its own, not that we're going to take the dog and force it up in. So depending on if you have a big SUV or anything like that, uh, it'd be great, ideally, if you can actually get up in and walk your dog through the car and come out the other side. That would be a really good uh, goal to work towards as well. But we got to get the dog in there first. So I'm going to break it really, I'm going to break it down. Uh, once you can get your dog up into the car on their own without like any physical pushing or prodding or anything like that, uh, what I would do is at that point shut the door and then get, get into the car, start it up and turn it back off, get out, go get your dog, get out of the car, go back inside the house and call it good. Um, so that's really, I would really break it down. So let's say in the next week, let's just practice getting your dog's feet up into the car. Do it once a day, maybe five, 10 minutes at a time. Uh, if you want to get some food out for treats, go ahead, uh, just to reward the fact that they're getting their feet up in the car. So just, just try stuff like that. Ba like I said, baby steps, um, and the pressure and release. Okay. So I think, I think that'll help you out quite a bit to start with. Um, Dave, I heard you should not separate dogs that don't get along in house because it makes them territorial, but what else could we do? Let them fight it out? Dave, no, you need structure in the house. So all those, those walks, structured walks 
need to be together, okay? Everything that you do with them has to be structured and it has to just have a starting time and an end time to it, okay? When you're dealing with dogs in the house, multi-dog multi -dog household, it's super duper important that they see you guys as an authority figure. You guys are the ones that control everything, food, walks, water, uh, their time and space. So I think to me, I think what would be ideal is if you took two dogs that are, you know, not getting along. If you took two dogs on a walk, one on each side of you, structured, short leash, but not tense, for a half an hour in the morning. When you get back, feed them next to each other, but tether them so they can't get near each other. They gotta be back here and they can't get near each other. But this is where they they feed. If they're growling, you're too close, you gotta back away. And then when they're done, unhook them, take them over to uh, a couple of beds that again, aren't close enough for them to fight, tether them, and that's their downtime. So every single little thing has to be structured and it has to convey and it has to communicate to them that you are the one that's in control, that it's not up to them, okay? Now, brothers and sisters squabble, okay? Dogs that live together are gonna have squabbles. It's not the end of the world, as long as it's not getting way out of hand, but, Structure is going to be most important, okay? Uh, let's see. Somebody else just piped in. Just got to make sure I got everybody else before I jump up. Okay. Uh, Kelly, my five-month-old lab is starting to counter surf. What can we do to get him to stop? We've removed everything from the counters, but he's still searching. Kelly, how long is how long has, has blah, 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 blah. how long has everything been removed from the counters? And I, I'd like a day, a day count. Like exactly, no exaggeration, you can't lie, because I'll find out. I'd like to know, give me, I need a day number. H how many days has it been? Because I got my answer waiting for you. I, I'm, I'm literally like, it's in the barrel, a week, good. You need about two more weeks, okay? Like religiously, because here's the thing, I'm, I, and this is what I had waiting in the chamber for you. Every single little thing that a dog does, there's motivation to, okay? Dogs don't walk aimlessly for no reason whatsoever. It just doesn't happen. There's a motivation to everything, okay? So if, um, if within this next two weeks that the dog did find something up there, then yes, guess what? That motivation starts all over again, okay? Now, if after the next two weeks that it's still happening, then what we're going to do is then we're going to address it. But before we even go down that road, let's give it two weeks, come back to me two Mondays from now and say, hey, uh, still doing it or not doing it or whatever, and then we'll address it from there. But I think it's a good idea that the counters are clean, like wiped clean, that there's nothing up there. Um, and also I would probably, I would kind of wonder too, maybe if the dog is possibly sniffing any food that is in cupboards above the counter, depending on if you have an island, if that's what he's sniffing at, or actual counters. Okay, I think that's uh, that's a that's a part of it. Uh, Gina, have a border collie mix, young pup, trying to hurt us as we walk. It seems runs alongside you and tries to get in front. Nips. Holy cow. Uh, nips at ankles. Thoughts on nipping this in the bud before he's grown. Uh, Gina, I don't think this is hurting. If you actually watch dogs hurting the correct way, like border collies uh, do, they actually will create space and they use their body as pressure and they use their body language to, to, to corral, okay? So if you watch stuff on, I don't know, pick something up on YouTube, border collie hurting, you'll notice that this dog isn't constantly nipping and biting. Um, so there's something going on here. This could be a prey drive issue, um, or it could be, um, well, let's look at it this way. How do we fix it? To me, especially if they're running alongside you and tries to get in front, I think that dog needs to be on a structured walk, short leash, but not tense. Um, you know, short leash with some slack in it. That dog needs more direction then we do need to try to react. So I think I'm gonna get a little bit more proactive with it, with that dog to start with, and get that dog uh, some leash skills and walking to start with, and then go from there. Uh, if it gets really, really bad, or if it's something that you feel like you can't address with a good solid week of some 
of um, leash leash walking, then I would just just grab an empty soda can and put like five or ten pennies in it. And as soon as your dog tries to go at your ankles, shake it um, to snap them out of it. But that's kind of uh, that's kind of what I do, Dave. Um, you know the pans and stuff. I don't want to get into that. I just want to get the dog to realize that there's nothing up there. That's all. Uh, you're welcome, Kelly. Good evening, Jelena. Uh, Cindy, 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 Cindy. That is my cousin. Uh, Nico hates the kids getting on the school bus in the morning. He goes right in the bus with them. Oh my gosh. I let him out in the morning, but he will not come back in until they're on the bus. I've had to go, I've had to get on top of him to get him out. I figured out a system, not really a problem. Just a dog who loves the kids. Just a fun comment. Um, Cindy, I would tether that dog in the morning so the dog doesn't get to experience that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, okay? Um, so not a forever thing, just, just in the morning when the school bus and the kids are getting on, that's all. And when they're done, you can unhook him, but I think that's what I would do rather than you having to jump on the bus every morning. Um, good. So I think I'm all caught up. Gina, you're very welcome. And seriously, YouTube Border Collie stuff, because they're not going to nip and bite. You guys, I think that's a big misconception about uh, herding dog, or I, I feel like that that's used a lot. You know, our dog nips at people, so it, it, it's trying to herd. Eh, not really, because uh, if if a if a border collie is herding sheep correctly, that dog will never make contact with the sheep whatsoever. Um, thank you for your info you give me on my dog Sandy. She's a great parent. Good. You're very very welcome, Jelena. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. We talked about common mistakes. We talked about furniture earlier. We talked about getting into bed. We talked about toys. Here's the other thing. I told you we're going to kind of do a little subcategory with toys. Uh, and it's doing pretty well. Awesome, Jelena. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's good to hear. See, that's why I do this, you guys, because somebody like Jelena is coming back and telling me how things are going better. So that's awesome. Here's my subcategory with toys. Squeakers. If your dog is not making very good decisions as far as reacting, nippy, bitey, that kind of thing, like, um, whose dog was it? The, um, uh, Gina's dog? Yeah, Border Collie mixed with a nippy thing. Any squeakers, out the door. In the garbage, gone forever, okay? Any dog that shows any sorts of uh, prey drive, anything along those lines, you guys, Zero, zero squeakers, because anytime they get a hold of something, whether it's an, a small animal, whether it's a little kid, whether it's a cat, whether it's a small dog, anything like that, that's going to make very, very similar sounds to the squeaker toys. And we don't want the dogs to be making those decisions. So squeaker toys, guts to go. I'm not a big fan of them. Plus they get annoying to me too. Again, not the dog trainer talking to me, um, but... Um, just kind of the person talking to me, the, the dog owner talking to me. That's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so that's just one of those things. Dave, I think healer actually nip at heels. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure, you guys. I, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm just not a believer in that, that's all. But anyways. Let's see. So yeah, so the squeakers, you guys have to go. That's all there is to it, okay? Um, all right, and then another common mistake, you guys, are the walks. I hear a lot of people uh, that we get for our clientele that uh, usually um, there's not a lot of structure going on in the house, and then the you, when we ask the question about what the walks are like, they go, oh, they're good. You know, the, the the dog will go ahead for a little while, turn back and look at us and check in, and then, uh, and then uh, keep, you know, kind of keep moving. And it's funny because I will look at it from the aspect of, okay, but if your dog is turning around, do you think the dog is actually checking in with you, saying, "Hi, mom and dad, I'm right here," or do you think the dog is turning around, going, "Yeah, my pack is still with me. They're following me," you know, two things that sound very different but can look almost uh, exactly alike. So I think that's something to consider. Does your dog actually check in with you or is your dog actually making sure that you're following them? Uh, do we have the answer? Probably not, but it's just one of those things to consider uh, when that's going on. So again, you guys, everybody's 
I think it's fair to say every dog owner wants their dog to be able to be off leash. That's all there is to it. And I get it. I think a dog should have to earn that. That's my opinion. Uh, in the same breath, I think that uh, a nice, you guys, nothing can really replace a nice structured walk um, on a nice, short, but loose leash. Short and loose. It can be done. I know there's many people that think that it probably can't. Uh, I've never been a big fan of just letting the dog out in front and just letting them go wherever they want to go. There has to be structure to it, you guys. And if you notice, everything that I've talked about tonight, furniture, bed, toys, and walks, structured. Okay, you guys? Structured. Uh, I, don't, I think it's fair to say that we would never raise kids without any structure whatsoever. You guys, look at school. Okay? There's class, there's recess, and then there's lunch, and then there's class, and then there's recess, depending on what age you are. Uh, you know, so there's structure that goes along with it. What do we do when we get home? There's structure. There's dinner. We go to bed. We get up. There's structure, okay? So I think it's really, really important that we look at our dogs the exact same way uh, to show them that we are providing structure for them. Now, you guys, there's nothing that's going to replace a walk that's going to be as important or as good as a walk to our dogs. Um, it's just one of those things. So I think it's it's something to um, really focus on, as, especially now that we get closer to winter for us in the northern part of the country here. You know, snow's a few months away. Uh, walks are going to get a little bit harder. Uh, dark, it's going to get darker a little bit sooner as well. So I think it's really important to start getting those walks under control. Um, it's just one of those things that, uh, that I think should be really, really important and should be something that we focus on. So again, these are some of the common mistakes that I think uh, the majority of our clients run into and I think um, the majority of dog owners run into as well. Uh, Jelena, I would suggest a bark collar. It depends on what you have going on, though. I'm not just not. I'm just not going to slap it on a dog. You know, I I I want to know what you're looking for, because there's times where it's right, and I think there's times where it's not. Uh, it's not something that we really need, you know. So, but the, again, I think it's very contextual, you guys. And dog training is very contextual. It's very. Um, you know what's going on now type of thing in what in what environment so you know a dog can do three different things um, or have three different state of mind but show the same body position in three different scenarios okay you know it's just it's it's one of those things think about it this way let's let's say you have a dog that's uh, in amongst or, or you know around a, a couple other dogs and this dog walks up and 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 picks up its paw like this and it's an aggressive dog um, this right here could mean getting ready to fight. You know, the dog is staring, holding its paw up. All right, so there's one scenario. Second scenario is um, dog is walking along, tail tucked, head low, really unsure, picks up its paw because it's very unsure. So here we're seeing that exact same motion, but two different scenarios. Now I'm gonna throw a third one in, okay? Uh, German short hair pointers, out hunting. You know, pointer dog. Uh, when it finally sees a bird, knows where it is, guess what? Picks up its paw and it's going to point. So, three different scenarios, you guys, with a dog doing something in their body language that is, that is exactly the same. So, it's all a part of it, you guys. It's all a part of it, okay? Uh, let's see. Jelena, I know you came back with something, Dave. We've been using long line 16 feet when walking. I will switch. I think that's a great idea, Dave. No doubt. Uh, Jelena, she barks at literally every little sound, especially big trucks going by. Uh, so Jelena, I think there's, I, I could probably look at this a few different ways. One of the ways that I'm, I'm kind of, my first thought was that your dog is actually very sensitive and probably just listening for every little sound. So depending on where you live and roads nearby, something along those lines, you may want to think about some ambient noise in the house to start with. So maybe a little bit of a louder radio, a little bit of a louder TV especially for when you're not there, that might help drown out the sound. Um, or maybe putting the dog in a different part of the house when it's going to be busy with vehicles going by or something along those lines. So I, I think, um, again, that's a part of it. 
I, I think in this situation, I actually want to address the dog before I want to put the bark collar on it. Uh, because I don't know if that, I don't, I don't feel like that's being, I don't feel like we'd be, I don't feel like we are going to be fair to the dog if we say here is a bark collar because you're barking at everything. Do you know what I mean? I think you have a very sensitive dog and it's probably sensitive during other aspects of its life too. And she just started to do this new thing every time I go outside. Even if I am in my yard, she will bark knowing it's me out there. Yeah. I think you need to, I think you, the stuff that I've listed tonight, Jelena, I think I would, I would think I would shake her world up. So think of her world as a snow globe, okay? And we got to shake it up. And I want everything to revolve around structure. Does she, is she crate trained too, Jelena? And how old is she? Give me, give me some details. What kind of dog? How old is she? Uh, how long have you had her? That kind of stuff. Because I think that's super duper important um, in this context with what's going on. And how often do you walk her too? I'm going to throw everything at you, I think. Uh, and you guys, this is actually part of, of uh, I guess you could say the evolution of what I, of how I deal with, with um, dog owners and how I work with you guys is sometimes I need to, I'm going to answer your question with about six other questions before I can give you an answer. So she's two, okay? She crate trained? Great Pyrenees, okay. Yeah, crate trained? Or no? And how often are you walking her? And is it structured? And is she socialized? That's another question. You guys, socializing your dog can take care of a lot of problems. Uh, and can't really walk her right now because she was just now in a car accident. Yikes. Uh... Yeah, so she's not crate trained. She needs a safe place to be, too. And I know Great Pyrenees, you're talking, you know, it's not, not like a Jack Russell Terrier size crate. You need a big crate. But look, if she's a sensitive girl, she needs to practice being in a safe place. Uh, so, uh, Jelena, I'm taking it she's injured then, too, because of being in a car accident? Or you are? Can't really walk her right now because she was just now in a car. Oh, so she's, she's injured. So that's difficult, too. I'm not gonna lie. And you guys, I love your participation tonight. That's in their DNA. You guys, seriously, I love your participation tonight. This is fantastic, you guys. We've had a great number of people on tonight. I love doing this, so please, if you get a second, share this, whether you share it now or share it afterwards. Uh, please share this, because it, it, it means a lot to me. The more people I can help for all of you, of uh, all of my Facebook friends on here, I, I can't I can't thank you enough, you guys. This is this is a great night, great turnout, um, and and I, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, okay, so back at it. But her leg is all better, but limping a little. Uh, no, she is not. But her leg is all better, but limping a little. Okay. Uh, I think this is what I want you to do. And for those, sorry about that. For those of you that have been on here before, you're gonna. This is gonna be a repeat to you, but I think it's super duper important. Uh, and some of you have probably seen this video that I'm going to suggest. And if you have, feel free to throw in. Her front leg was broke, but now is all better, but still limping. Okay. So this is what I want you to do, you guys. Uh, I'm sorry, Jelena. This is what I want you to do. Go onto YouTube and search Vermont Dog Trainer Impulse Control. Okay. It's about a 16 minute video. I'm sure some people that are watching us right now uh, have probably watched part of it. And I think it's important that you watch that so you can get her the exercise that she needs while she's, uh, while she's still healing, you know? It's just one of those things, so. Uh, God, I love these questions, you guys. And I may get, you guys, when you fire your questions away and you see them go, uh, just be patient with me, cause I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get to everybody here, okay? Uh, and I've got to get to this over here. Good, Dina. I'm glad you were thinking about it. Okay, I have a great Pyrenees that's three that we've had for five months. I walk her pretty much every day, unless it's really hot. But she barks aggressively at any dog we see. Not sure how to socialize her without putting other dogs at risk. Uh, so Kaylee, depending on where you live, that's something that we actually can take care of for you. 
uh, especially if you're just looking for some daycare. If you are not near us, uh, let me know where you are and I can maybe try to find somebody around there that can help you out. Uh, but, yeah, I think some training is going to help you. So again, Kaylee, if you don't want to put your location up here, just um, just just send me a direct message on, on this Facebook page and I'll see what I can do to help you out and find somebody either in your area or see what we can offer you either way, okay? I think you probably just wrote again. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, thank you. Um, yeah, Kaylee, just send me a just send me a message just and saying that St. Louis, Missouri, and I I will see if I can uh, find somebody for you. Okay, I'm sure I can. It's just it just might take me a little bit. And you guys, for those of you that don't know too, I'm in the process of an interviewing a dog trainer from every state on my podcast, Vermont Dog Trainer Show. Uh, I made it through eight states so far, and and I'm working my way through. Uh, and it's been a blast so far. So we just uh, we just covered Texas last week. If you guys get a second, go on to my podcast Facebook page, which is Vermont Dog Trainer Podcast, and it gives you the lineup and everybody that I'm talking to and that kind of stuff. So, okay. Oh, and Kaylee, thank you so much. You're awesome. Kaylee, how did you hear about me? If you're in St. Louis, I would love to hear, hear that tidbit. Okay, and then there was somebody else in here. Ah, there we go, Daniela. Hi, I know you said you started your doggy daycare at your basement. I did, and right out these back doors into the fence. Um, I want to open my own. Beside having my own dogs, I don't have much experience. I'm a nurse. What do you think I should do to get experience? Um, Daniela. You know, it may not hurt for you to, to get a job at a, at a dog daycare to start with, just to see if you like it first, um, before you take the plunge and trying to do something at home and then getting six months or 10 months into it and realizing this isn't for you. Uh, so maybe just find something part-time kind of as your side hustle uh, to where you can work in a dog daycare and see if it's something that you truly want to do. Uh, I, I think that's probably the, the route that I would take to start with, you know, now, let's say that you're ready to take that plunge uh, and jump feet first. I started just taking in dogs for daycare and boarding. Uh, if you don't want to do the boarding and the overnight thing yet, then just do daycare. Obviously, you can send all the dogs home at the end of the day. Mm. Business here. I'm going to give you some business advice here too, though. I will tell you that facilities that have just daycare going on, uh, it can be a tough gig because you don't offer the boarding piece. And depending on what you offer, um, can also dictate, you know, how busy you are. Uh, as you can see, I do a lot of Facebook stuff. So if you're going to market, do, do your marketing on Facebook. Um, or the other thing too, Daniela, um, I would consider going to, um, going to workshops too. I, you know, there's always... Um, dog training workshops that are that are being offered all around the country all the time uh, probably sometimes ad nauseum but uh, there, there's always some out there so I think that's probably a, a, a you know something to consider as well so that's that's kind of where I would go from there Dave I'm glad you love the podcast I love doing them that's for sure um, she, she, Brady, I, I, I would agree she could volunteer at a shelter, but that's not going to give her that daycare setting. That's just dogs in kennels taking them out to go to the bathroom and back in. That's why, I, I don't know, I just kind of felt like she's looking at um, having her own. So that's all a part of it. And Daniela, what state are you in? Mass? Um... And again, Kaylee, I would love to know where you heard about from being from Missouri. Hey, you guys, this would be a quick, fun game. In the in the next minute, all I want you to write is the state that you're in right now. I'd be I'm so curious. You guys got to help me out. You gotta you gotta tell me. You gotta all of my Facebook friends out there watching me right now. Look, you gotta put in your state. I want to know where you're at. Just your state. That's all. I don't need any other information. Just your state. Brady, very active group. It's fantastic. Really good. 
Yeah, so there's Massachusetts. Aw, there's my mom-in-law. Hey, Dina. Jelena, upstate New York. Awesome. Western Mass, close to Brattleboro. Nice. Jania's Vermont. Malo's Vermont. I love my roll call here, you guys. Tanya. I think we've talked before, Tanya. Good. Vermont. Dave's Vermont. Roxanne, New York. How awesome is this, you guys? Heather, I don't know if we've spoken before. Vermont, nice. Look at all my friends pulling through. Cindy. Hey, Cindy. We haven't met, but I got a hug from you once. <laughs> Pennsylvania. There's my mom. What state of confusion? I believe you, Anne. Bonnie's Vermont. Uh, look at all my friends. How awesome is this? My canine crew. Ah, uh, yes, Kim, how are you? Whitney's Vermont. This is awesome, you guys. Uh, when you uh, when you get a second, I just... <laughs> Thermo Vegas. <laughs> uh, when you get a second, I put up a new little video movie type thing on our Facebook page. If you guys get a second, check that out. I would love to see what you thought about it. I was just messing around today with an iMovie app. Um, and it was, it's pretty cool. Jelena, uh, did you see my last comment? Hold on. And I, maybe I skipped over it. Up, I saw upstate New York. Is that what you meant? Jelena, and you said, okay. Her front leg was broke. Yeah, I think I saw it. I think I saw it. Dave, yes, I'm going to Ohio this weekend. No, go up. Kim, I'm glad you saw the movie. I, I, it was fun. Was it? I don't know. I enjoyed doing it. Jelena, I'm looking for you. Did you see my last comment? Okay, so now I'm looking before that one. Upstate New York. Um, Dina, I don't have a video for that, but it's not going to be any different than crate training a younger dog. I think in and out, just like I said to the lady in the or the person getting the dog in the car, get you know get them in a couple of times. Actually, there's a really good um, get the book, get the Let Dogs Be Dogs book. There's a really good um, section in there on crate training, Dina. Really good. Cash. Yes, I do remember Cash. Jelena, I can't find the comment. I'm sorry. I, if you can throw it up there again, I'd be more than happy to answer or address it. That's for sure. This is awesome, everyone. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, let dogs be dogs. Yeah, and it's just a good book overall, too. Oh, is that it? Bonnie. Dash. What age recommend puppy to start training classes? Getting a nine-week pup this coming weekend. I mean, I think you can. I think you can start training as early as you want to. I mean, they start service dog training at like two weeks or something crazy like that. Just starting them to get all touched and all that kind of stuff. So don't don't be afraid. Jump right on it. Jump right on it. No question. All right. So again, you guys, we went over our common mistakes. If you guys are just joining us or you came in late, uh, these are the things we went over, um, you know, what dog owners make, these casual mistakes, uh, you know, whether you know it or not. So again, there's furniture, getting on the furniture, there's getting in bed with you, okay? Uh, there's toys, obviously, that we talked about with a little subcategory of squeaky toys, and then your structured walks, okay, you guys? So, um this has been an awesome night. Man, oh man, oh man. I hate to shut this down, but I'm getting tired. When you're talking for an hour straight, even though... Here's another thing, you guys. 
and I've been thinking about this. Uh, I don't know, some of you may remember that I did a two day, a free two day workshop uh, last winter. It ended up being in January or in February because I had to postpone it. I'm kind of thinking about doing it again. What do you guys think? It'd be another Saturday, Sunday, two days, totally free, cost you zero dollars. Two full days of learning how we train dogs, learning about dogs, training, behavior, socializing, nutrition, you name it. That's what I'm thinking about. Me too, Yon. You're the best. I have to admit it. I have all three dogs on the bed with me. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, Dina. Yeah, you guys. So this is what I'm thinking. I, I, I really, I don't know. The last one was really good. I, and I, I actually really love talking in front of people. Uh, and I love Q&A kind of stuff too because I feel like everybody has a different scenario or a different question or something that I can address. Uh, and I've, 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 I don't know. I love the two-day thing and I know it's a huge commitment on, for you guys too. I mean, I know it's a huge commitment uh, to do two days in a row. And I feel like one day will give you okay value and some value. Um, Jelena, I'm sorry. I don't, there's nothing coming through. Do you guys see? Can anybody else tell me if you're seeing Jelena's comments that I'm missing? Because I don't want to leave her hanging. But again, so I'm thinking about the workshop thing. Uh, I think it would also be cool to do... Um, Roxanne, I've enjoyed watching, learning a few things that I hope will help me with my nine pounds of trouble. Awesome. Dina, I don't see it. Okay, good. So I'm not the only one here. So Jelena, I'm not ignoring you, I swear. And all these other people are jumping in too. So I'm not exactly sure what's happening. But again, you guys, I'm thinking about this workshop thing. I think it would be fun. Uh, I wish that a lot of you lived closer because there's... Th I've actually thought about doing some like a meetup kind of thing where we maybe just meet out, uh, I don't know, go out and grab a bite to eat. I think it'd be fun to sit at a huge table and just talk dogs for a while, just do some Q&A kind of stuff. But that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what I, th I, th I think that would be fun too. But I don't know. We'll see. So that's what I'm thinking about. Another two-day workshop, probably in January, just because it's slower for us, easier for me to put something together during that time, and offer it to you guys for free. So for you guys that are out of state, we can certainly give you the name of a hotel nearby. Uh, that would be pretty cheap, I think. I don't think it's too, too expensive. Uh, and you're really only looking for a couple of nights. And that's really your cost. So it's just one of those things. But you guys, awesome awesome, awesome night. Again, if you can share this, I would really, really, really appreciate this. Uh, it, it is uh, so much fun to do this. I, I did not think this, this was going to go an hour tonight, but it did. And I can't thank you all enough. You, you guys really make this, uh, make this work for me. Because if you guys weren't on here, I wouldn't be coming on here. That's for sure. But uh, you guys had a lot of really good questions tonight and a lot of really good comments. I thought the common mistake thing was a really good uh, subject to cover. And uh, hopefully this kind of gives you guys some insight. Daniela, yeah, we're really close to Elmore. Like, uh, my actual facility is probably 15 to 20 minutes at the most from Elmore. At the most. That's if you're running into traffic. Jelena, thank you for the share. That comment I got. <laughs> That's for sure. And Dave, you guys, you're very welcome. I can't thank you enough. All of my canine... Maybe that's what I... Should I call you guys my canine crew? Is that good? Is that a good name or is that a bad name? Canine crew. Right? That's kind of cool. I don't think I've invented it by any means, but I think it has a nice little ring to it. Yeah. All right. You guys, again, fantastic night. Thank you again. I mean, we teetered between 20 and 30 here most of the night. Tanya, love the podcast. Great info. Looking forward to catching up with you with my pack. That's fine. Thanks, Night Night. Signing out, Canine Crew. Nice. <laughs> All right, Canine Crew. That sounds weird saying it like that, though. But good, Mika. I'm glad you guys love this. Good. See? This makes me want to do it more and more and more and more and more. 
Sandy loves people. Oh, good. See, I got that comment, Jelena. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. All right. So keep your kind of ear to the ground thinking January. We'll see what happens. Just have to play it by ear. All right. You guys have a great night. Thank you so much for coming out. We will see you on Monday. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm on somebody, else, another dog trainer's podcast tomorrow uh, from uh, Gary Kassara. I interviewed him uh, like a month ago or so, something like that. He invited me onto his podcast tomorrow. So once I get that link, I'll be putting it up so you guys, because me and Gary kind of think a little alike. We're a little, a little out there when not, you know, uh, just one of those things. Much better than Dancing with the Stars. Awesome, Cindy. All right, you guys, have a great night, and thank you very, 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 very much. Bye-bye.